Good morning, uh, Casey. I'm just gonna invite you to stand with us this morning. It is great to be alive in the land of the living, and I just wanna personally wish everybody a merry, merry Christmas. So we're gonna join in and we're gonna say, oh come, all ye faithful. Oh come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh come, ye, oh come, ye to Bethlehem. Come and be old him, born the King of angels. Oh come, 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 let us adore him. Oh come. for different reasons with the gifts and the festivities but the greatest gift is Jesus the greatest festivity 
activity we can have is to celebrate Jesus, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place today. Holy Spirit, you are a teacher, you are a guide, and you lead us into truth. And we desire truth in our inward parts today. So we give you freedom in this place to minister to each of us as we come, as we celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ coming to earth for us. We celebrate with a newness knowing that because of your everlasting love you came to get us back and we accept your invitation today. We release ourselves to you to be received back by you by this great King and we thank you Father. We thank you Father for your love today. We thank you. We glorify you. We magnify you for great are you, Lord, and greatly to be praised. And now, Father, we give you this service, everything that will be said and done today. Let it be done for your glory and for your honor. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I'm just going to invite you to walk around and love on each other. This is the Christmas season, so this is a good season. We should be in a loving spirit as we sing joy to the world. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart sing and heaven and nature sing and heaven and heaven nature sing it with me joy to the world the Lord is come let earth receive a king let every heart let every heart Heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing. Okay, we're going to go on to the second verse. Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let men, let men, their songs in glory. While fields and floods, while fields and floods. Joy, repeat the sound in joy. Repeat, repeat, repeat the sound in joy. The third verse. No more let sin and sorrows grow. Nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to Far as the curse is found, far as, far as the curse is found. No more let sin, no more let sin and sorrows flow. No more, no more invest the ground. He comes to me. Far as the curse is found, far as the curse is found, far as, far as the curse is found.
to give up. Welcome to all of you here, especially to our online viewers. As you view this service today, I just want you to keep in mind the purpose, as I said earlier, for this season. I want to welcome you to this service. And as our pastor always say, you are, we are one of the beautiful places on the planet. We are here in beautiful Exuma, a beautiful island. And we love God and we are serving Him in spirit and in truth. And I want to welcome all of you, all of our visitors. Any visitors today among us? Anybody visiting for the first time? Very good. Anyone, any other visitors? Yes, Sam. And come, let's give them a RKC welcome. Praise you. Thank you. you can have been somewhere else other another ministry but we want to say thank you for coming this morning and I pray that what you will experience would be a blessing to you and you will not go away the way you came amen amen now we're going to have a selection by our Spanish sisters give them a round of applause they are finished and now kids would come and do a drama for us. morning kids do you know what today is 
Yes, it's Christmas, the day when Santa Claus makes an appearance with Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and the rest of the sleigh. And it's about Christmas trees and presents. Who likes presents? What about you adults? Parents? Do you like parents? Wonderful. Well, today we are going to celebrate the perfect gift. Who knows, man? They've got us restocking until late. Brookstone doesn't have a machine to restock the store itself. It functions as an iPad keyboard that folds into an airplane pillow. Maybe someday. But no, uh, we're definitely going to be here until midnight. That's nothing. I've been here since midnight last night. Any big arrest? That answer your question? Actually, no. no. We had 37 clothing sensors go off last night. Turned out they'll all be 426s. False notification. Still think one of those guys was lying. Didn't have enough time to get a search warrant for his car, though. If only you had more time. That's what I said. Mm. Uh, you want some coffee? No, uh, mine's still hot from yesterday. This keeps liquids hot for 97 hours. <laughs> Brookstone. Unit 13, this is dispatch. This is Unit 13, over. We got a 514 in C-236, over. Copy that, I'm on my way to C-236. If you don't mind, I'm gonna stop by t -Von and grab a Phoenix Jasmine tea on the way, over. All right, guys, I gotta go. Apparently, a woman's being harassed at the hair straightener kiosk. Isn't that normal? Not on my watch. 13 on his way. Can't tell if I like Christmas or if I hate it. What? How can you hate Christmas? Christmas is like the perfect holiday. Mm, three straight weeks of work with Mariah Carey on repeat. I don't think perfect is the word that comes to mind. Well, I love everything about Christmas, especially Christmas morning. <laughs> Except that it isn't really Christmas morning. Yeah, we don't celebrate until a few days later either because Kathy's family lives in Vermont, so... No, no. Technically, Jesus, son of God or not, was actually born in the spring. Read an article about it. So, Jesus wasn't born on Christmas? Maybe Jesus and Santa struck a deal. Santa was like, I can't wear this in April. And Jesus was like, okay, that's cool. Well, we'll move it to December. Just make sure you hook me up with the awesome sandals I wanted. You've been waiting to use that joke, haven't you? Since August. But was Santa even alive back then? Pretty sure he came way after that. A uh, Christmas story is the one about baby Jesus and the manger scene. Yeah, my mom has one of those on her mantle. It's like a toga party. Ha uh ha. -huh. What's a manger? Uh, someone who manges. Siri, what is a manger? A manager is a person responsible for administering all or part of the company. Nice, Devin. There was background noise, okay? Siri is flawless. Flawless like the maps? <laughs> so, regardless of what a manger or manager is, it was a big deal because his mom was a virgin, so everyone wanted to come check it out for themselves. Wow, someone's been to church. Most Sundays. Virgin, huh? According to the Bible. You know the Bible never actually talks about Christmas? What? I am 99.9988% sure the Christmas story originated in the Bible. I bet you a nano that it doesn't. Hey, yo, Santa, uh, settle something for us. Does the Bible talk about Christmas? How should I know? I'm Jewish. <laughs> Mark, you go to church. Aren't you required to carry a Bible around? Nope. Only rules my church has is you can't reserve a seat with a program. Hang on. Downloading the Bible app. Give me a sec. I only get 3G in here. Back so soon? Yeah. We confiscated his weapon, put him in a holding cell. By holding cell, do you mean the window store? Up top. So, how's that app coming? Yeah, I searched Christmas and nothing. What? And actually, I changed my mind. I'd like a charger for my phone. It's the same price as a Nano. I'll show you. Wait, oh, did we just decide that the Christmas story is not in the Bible? No, and I'm going to prove it. Okay, hold on. I'm Googling it. Got it. Twas the night before Christmas, and all through the house, it was a house, not a manger. Wrong Christmas story, genius. Whoa. Let's not just throw that term around loosely, okay? Let me see you, Paul. I'll be careful with it. It's actually okay if he drops it. I have Apple Care. Actually, as an employee, I have Apple Care on my Apple Care 
just in case it runs out before we drop it twice, so. You must have all the girlfriends. Okay, here's a Christmas story. You guys ready? Wait, hold on, wait. Now. Luke chapter two, I'm just gonna read this. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world, and everyone went to their... Am I interrupting something? Oh, nothing important. Just the Bible. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, uh, to Bethlehem, the town of David. Uh, too many details. Because he belonged to the house and line of David. Uh, he went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. Mary the virgin. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. Hey, I'm... Jim from Brookstone. I don't think that we've met. Hey, Jim. Brad. I don't work here. I was just looking for a place to sit down. My wife thinks I'm at Starbucks. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. I know that you are a shepherd from 10 BC that hasn't even seen a light bulb. And I'm an angel that is basically a huge ball of glowing light and power. But do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Cloths or clothes? Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left him and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Orange chicken? Try one. Sample. No, I, I am pretty sure that they did not say that. No, thank you. We're good. Hold on a second. I'm going to firm it on that orange chicken. I don't think you should talk for everybody else. Uh, grab me one, Kevin. Copy that. Okay. Uh, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. I'm just going to imagine that they all hopped on their segways. <laughs> <laughs> What's so funny? So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Wait, that, that's it? Didn't hear a Christmas in there. Yep, that's it. That was perfect. Well, that story was much more weird than I expected. Thank you. Guys, you can't say that about the Bible. Why not? It is. Has an angel ever talked to you? Let me get this straight. Uh, a baby is born, an angel comes down and tells some shepherds they get really excited so that 2,000 years later, I get an electric shaver and have to pretend to like my mother-in-law's casserole? Perfect. It is perfect. I mean, look at what we've been putting up with for the past three weeks. Everybody's running around this mall trying to find the perfect gift for someone. But we all know what's going to happen the day after tomorrow. It's not the right size. It's not the right color. I, I don't have a receipt. I don't want this. So what's your point? Mark, read that part about the baby. It's kind of all about the baby. The part about it being a savior. Oh. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born. That's it. Please explain. The perfect gift. It's a savior. What does that even mean, a, a savior? I, I don't know, but, uh, but it's got to be good. I mean, who would return a savior? It is good. It's better than you think. Uh, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. It's the perfect gift because it's for all people. A savior has been born to you. To you. To you. To you. Even to Kevin. Well, thanks. Unit 13, please respond. We got a 908 in C-138. Copy that. Over. Somebody just stole a penny out of the fountain. I'm out of here, guys. 13. 
Jenna was right. It, um, it, is, it is perfect, but um, it, it's almost suspiciously perfect. It's almost like too perfect to be true. It's almost like a story that somebody would make up in order to convince people to do things because life isn't really all that perfect. You know, actually the Christmas story doesn't begin with the, with the, uh, with the angel appearing to, to Mary. The, the Christmas story begins with, with an angel appearing to a couple who was too old to have children to tell them they were going to finally have a child. Which, which was kind of perfect because in those days, people thought if you didn't have children, God had cursed you and God was mad at you and you'd either done something bad in a former life or you had done something bad and were just out of favor with God. And so this angel appears and says to, to Elizabeth and to Zechariah that you're going to have a son, you're going to name him John, and he's actually going to announce the coming of, of the Messiah that the Jews have waited for forever. And so it was kind of perfect because it was foreshadowing of the fact that when Jesus grew up and was a man, part of his ministry would be to people who thought they were out of favor with God for something they had done or their parents had done and they would never ever find favor with God. So that part of it was perfect. And then finally the angel appears to Mary and she's a teenager, maybe 14 years old. You probably knew that. And, and, and the, the, the angel says, Mary, you have found favor with God to which Mary must've thought I'm 14. How could I have found favor with God? I haven't even lived long enough to find favor with God. And the angel says, it doesn't matter because God has just chosen you. He's just shown favor on you, which again, is perfect because throughout Jesus' ministry, he would go around showing favor to people who had not done anything in order to earn his favor. In fact, he would show favor to people who had done things to, you know, create a sense of displeasure between them and God. And so it was like this cool foreshadowing thing. It's such a perfect story. And then maybe the the best part of all is that the first group of people that find out about Jesus being born are shepherds. And we don't understand this because we don't have shepherds, but shepherds were outsiders. They were kind of outcasts in terms of the whole religious system. And their religious system, you couldn't touch dead things, you couldn't handle dead things. And shepherds were always handling dead things and dealing with dead things. So they would raise the sheep and give the sheep to the good people and the good people would go have a sacrifice and get close to God. Meanwhile, the shepherds were kind of the outsiders. It would be easy to be a cynical shepherd, a skeptical shepherd, but they were certainly outside the religious system. And yet in this perfect story that's so perfect, it seems like somebody just made it up. The angel appears to the shepherds, the outsiders, and says, we want you to be the first to know, you outsiders, that God has done something in the world and God is doing something incredible. And we want you to see it. Even though you have never been invited to anything religious because you are always ceremonially unclean because sometimes you walk in front of the sheep, but sometimes you walk behind the sheep. And we know that puts you on the outside, but we want you to be the first to know. We want to invite you in to this thing that God has done. It's just perfect because when Jesus would grow up and be a man in his ministry, he would spend so much time going to people who were outsiders, people outside the religious system, people outside a relationship with God and saying, God loves you and you're invited as well. So the whole story is, is almost suspiciously perfect. And then there's like this, this broader narrative that we just get a little glimpse of that you have to know a little bit about history because 1,500 miles away from Jesus being born, about 1,500 miles, is Caesar Augustus. Now, you learned about Caesar and Augustus, Augustus in school, and maybe you remember he was like the emperor, the, really the first emperor of Rome. He created the, the peace of Rome. He reigned for like over 40 years. And the interesting thing about Caesar Augustus that makes it such an interesting part of the story is that his adopted father was Julius Caesar and Julius Caesar was, was called the divine Julius. He was, he was given the status of deity, which meant that Caesar Augustus was the, considered the son of a God, the son of a God. So you have like the son of a God in you know, Rome who's ruling the world. And then you have the son of God being born in Bethlehem at the same time. And there's all this tension and there's all this drama. And eventually, it's such a perfect story. Eventually, the only time the world will ever hear about Caesar Augustus, other than a paragraph in a book or a lecture in college, the only time we ever hear about Caesar Augustus is when we tell the story of Jesus, that the first emperor of Rome becomes a footnote in the story of a Jewish carpenter. I mean, it's just absolutely perfect. It's the perfect story, but it's so perfect that it kind of makes you suspicious because life, life isn't that perfect. There's not subplots and foreshadowing and everything works out. And when we're children, it's easy to accept it as true. 
But as we grow older, we begin to slide this into the category of myth and fable and fairy tale. And this certainly doesn't help, does it? Everywhere we look, there's like, it's almost like a cartoon. It's almost, it's, we almost make the whole scene look like a fairy tale. Everybody's so perfect. I mean, they have perfect skin and they have perfect smiles and they have perfect hair and Jesus is blonde. And you know how many little Middle Eastern children are born blonde? Yeah, so the whole thing is, it's so, it's just, and even look at the animals are perfect. Everything's perfect. And every woman here who's watching or listening who's ever had a baby knows that if you had had a baby in that building without an epidural, you would not look like that. <laughs> And you would not be happy. And we liked the song, but it would not have been a silent night, would it? <laughs> and so what do we do? We, we, we take this, this story that's so perfect, who could believe it? That's so mystical and magical, who could believe it? And then we, we create this kind of thing. So no wonder as we get older, we take the story that meant so, us, so much to us in childhood and we kind of shove it into a category of myth and legend and folklore and fable. But you know, it's not even really good myth. See, in a myth or a fable or folklore, you, there's, there's like a moral to the story. Remember growing up, you heard the story of George Washington cut down the cherry tree. And then they asked him, did you cut down the cherry tree? And he told the truth and nobody believes that really happened, but it's a good lesson about telling the truth. What do we learn from this? Make reservations, call ahead. I mean, there's really, there's really no application. There's no moral to this story. It's not even good myth. And yet for many of us, that's what it becomes. And of course it does, because it's too perfect. It really is too good to be true. And then we take off the rough edges and take off all the dirt and take out the sound and the smell and we set it on a mantle or on a table somewhere or out in the front yard and we drive by it and it becomes a fairy tale. It becomes a cartoon. And it really becomes a fairy tale and a cartoon really with no meaning maybe a little momentary inspiration that takes us back to childhood, but certainly nothing to take us into adulthood. But to the rescue, to the rescue, come the two guys that actually bring us the Christmas story, Matthew and Luke. Matthew was a follower of Jesus. Matthew knew Jesus, Matthew knew Mary. Matthew knew John who took care of Mary until Mary eventually died. Matthew, who had access to the information when he sat down to write his story, he did not begin once upon a time. He begins this way. Abraham had a son who had a son who had a son, and he meticulously goes through this genealogy that most of us find boring because he wanted everyone to know Jesus was an actual person who really lived, who was connected to all the right people, and that the story he was about to tell, as difficult as it would be to believe, actually took place. And then he begins the story this way. He says, the birth of Jesus happened as follows. And he dives right into the icky details. There was a man named Joseph who was you know, betrothed to a, a woman named Mary. And he finds out she's pregnant. And then he has a dilemma on his hands. And the story begins. And it's so realistic. And those kinds of things happen all the time. But Luke's even better. Luke, who wasn't one of Jesus' disciples, Luke was a doctor. But Luke knew Peter and Luke knew John. And Luke was even knew James, the brother of Jesus. And so Luke sits down and he realizes there's so many stories and there's so many different accounts and there are even some conflicting details. And so Luke decides, you know what? I want to get this right. So here's how Luke begins his story of the birth of Jesus. Look at this. He says, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. In other words, there are a lot of people who were trying to get this on paper because it's so amazing. Now this isn't 20, 50, 70, 100, 200 years later. This is during the time that these events actually took place. He said, there's so many people trying to get this right. He says this, just as, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. He said, there were so many accounts and so many stories floating around from people who were actually there. And then he says this, with this in mind, with this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, he says, so I decided I wanted an orderly account. I wanted an account that reflected what actually happened. And since I had access to Peter, and since I had access to John, and since I had access to Matthew, and since I had access to Mary, since I had access to the eyewitnesses, 
I decided to put together an account that would accurately reflect what actually happened because nobody is going to believe it. He says this, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. So that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. Theophilus, you've heard these stories. Theophilus, you've been taught these things. But I want you to know this isn't myth. This isn't legend. This isn't fairy tale. This isn't oral tradition that was passed down generation after generation after generation. And then it began to be exaggerated and embellished. This happened among us. And the eyewitnesses of these things are still with us. So I have thoroughly investigated them and I'm about to tell you the story of how it actually in history happened. And then he does something extraordinary, something that doesn't happen in myth and fable. He anchors the birth of Jesus to a very specific period in time. He says this, chapter two says, in those days, Caesar Augustus, in those days, Caesar Augustus, in other words, he says, I'm gonna anchor this to history because this actually happened. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. And then he gives us even a greater parenthetical detail so that people would know this was a period of history they could track down and know with certainty that these events took place. He says this, this was the first census that took place while Quirinius, was governor of Syria. And extra biblical material tells us that Syria actually had a governor named Quirinius, Quirinius. And that while he was governor, there were actually two census taken. So this isn't once upon a time. This isn't long, long ago in a land far, far away. This isn't once upon a time there was a king. This was during the reign of Caesar, while Quirinius was the governor of Syria. There was a census that had to be taken that every historian would be able to track down and pinpoint the time in history when this actually happened. And then he said, a man named Joseph was visited by an angel. Mary visited by an angel, took her to be his wife, went to Bethlehem to register because every male had to go to their hometown. And while he was there, she gave birth to a son and they named him Jesus. And as it turns out, he would become the savior of the entire world. So here's my question for you. What if it's true? What if it's true? What if the faith that you had as a child and the faith that I had as a child was the right faith? What if these events actually took place in history? What if you knew the certainty that Luke wants you to have that these were events that took place in such a way that everyone knew God had done something unique in the world? If it's true, then what the angel said is so significant and what the angel said is so significant for every single person on the planet. When the angel said this, remember, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. The people like Elizabeth and like Zechariah who thought I must be out of favor with God because look what happened in my life. Things never go right for me. God never answers my prayer. If there is a God, God must not love me. To which the angel would say, no, no, no. This is a message for you as well. Because God does know you. And God does hear your prayer. And God does love you. In fact, God chose someone just like you to be a part of the story. It's good news to all people, even those people who think, what in the world could I do to ever gain God's favor? How can I ever gain God's favor? How could I ever be good enough to gain God's favor? And the angel would say, no, this is for you as well. Because like Mary, God just loves you. God just favors you. God just likes you. Not because of anything you've done, but just because he loves you. It's to all the people, even the people who are like the shepherds. For those of you who would say, I'm not even a religious person. I can totally identify with the shepherds. I'm an outsider. I don't even like religious people. Religious people don't like me and I don't like them. We have an agreement. I visit my parents during Christmas and Easter and we just don't talk about it because I'm not one of them. And the angel would say, you are part of that all, that there is great joy for all people because Jesus would demonstrate in an unmistakable, remarkable way that he came for those who were nothing like him. To all the people today in the town of David, 
a savior. A savior. See, what makes this story perfect and what makes this the story that we long to be real and what makes this so, this so perfect for you is that God didn't simply send you a second chance and God didn't send you another list. God sent you exactly what you needed and he sent me exactly what I needed. A savior. Because we are not mistakers who need a second chance. We are sinners who need a savior. And do you know how I know that you know you're a sinner? You don't even keep your own rules. You don't even keep your own rules. And if there is a God in heaven who has any rules at all, you know if you fall short of your own rules, chances are from time to time you're gonna fall short of his. And the reason this was great news is because God didn't send another list of commandments. God sent exactly what you need. He sent the perfect gift, which makes this the perfect story. He sent you and he sent me a savior. Jesus, the Christ, the savior has been born to you. He is Messiah, the Lord. So it's perfect. It's perfect, but it's better than perfect. It's true. It's better than perfect. It actually happened. It's better than perfect because it's not a standalone story that we can look at from time to time this time of year. It's a story that encompasses your story because you are part of that all. And you, as Mark said, are part of that you. That he came for you and 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 every you that you will ever be eyeball to eyeball with for the rest of your life. It's better than perfect. It's true. And he did it for me and he did it for you.